All right, folks, we're about to get started with our road mapping session. I think we're, we're about to pull a couple more humans, hopefully, all the way in here. Um, uh, for everyone who was at the IPFS thing last year and stayed through the end, um, hopefully this is familiar. We did the same track last year, um, and we have a couple of core goals with this track. Um, one, we want to reflect on some awesome progress. A number of these tracks happened also at last year's thing, where we came and came together, set a couple of goals, talked about some of the milestones that we had over the, the rest of the year after last year's thing. Let's take a look back at some of those things and reflect on the overall progress we made since then. Um, there's also been a whole ton of tracks, whole ton of learning that have happened here. This gives us an opportunity to kind of like sit back together with all the people who were in some of those tracks, synthesize our learning so that we can send people a really short teaser for why they should watch all of the many track videos that are going to come out of this thing. Um, it also helps us share state and learnings between many different tracks. I know I was experiencing a heck of a lot of FOMO about not being able to be in three places at once for different tracks that were happening at the same time. So it gives you a little bit of an opportunity to hear about lessons where you weren't um, in them at the same same moment. Um, we also you know, want to drive the learnings and um, things we've talked about in this forum into action. We want to now go and do stuff based on all the conversations we've been having. Um, so let's document what exactly we're going to go do so that we have a higher chance of actually making it happen um, and actually being able to push forward into the rest of this year with some pretty awesome uh, kind of improvements and collaborations that are going to be happening between groups. Um, finally, maybe there's some big milestones that are happening over the course of the year where there's an opportunity for people to join forces or opportunity for us to build momentum together um, and celebrate those upcoming milestones. So let's flag those here, A, so that we can check back in on them at the next IPFest thing and maybe quarterly as we go along, um, but also so that other people are aware of them and can help come and be part of those exciting milestones. Um, and we have a, an awesome kind of like community session tomorrow where we can talk about how we can make some of those happen as well. Um, so here's high level timing and agenda for this session. We're right on time so far, um, talking about how we're gonna use our time. Um, Juan's gonna give us a little bit of a breakdown around cross project road mapping and some of the tools um, that exist and why they work the way they do that can help us um, roadmap across many different teams and working groups and communities. Um, and then what's gonna happen is we're gonna have three different working sessions that are each 15 minutes long that are all gonna happen here. Um, so we're gonna play a little bit of music Musical chairs, and you're going to use these tables here to get together with people from your track. Well, what if you attended multiple tracks? Choose one of them where you were the most committed, most involved, had the most ideas. You know, you have to pick your favorite child. Um, and so each of our 15 minute sessions, you'll get together with other people from your track and you'll fill out a set of slides, a quick summary, um, and we'll do that. 15 minutes for our Saturday sessions, 15 minutes for our Sunday sessions, 15 minutes for our Monday sessions, and then at the end of those 45 minutes, we are going to present the summary of each one of those tracks. There are 10 tracks, so it'll be great. Um, hopefully it only takes us 30 minutes. I've left us 45, just in case. Um, but we'll have our track presentations where each uh, choose a presenter from your track, um, and they will come up here and present the, the summary and recap. This is gonna be your highlight reel that you can send to people to convince them to go watch all of the different talks in your track, to summarize really the, the exciting takeaways and next steps that are happening there. Um, and so uh, we'll do those presentations presentations, and then we'll all applaud and celebrate each other and uh, go to happy hour. So that is our plan for this session. We'll tell you this timeline again in a second, but first I wanted to talk a little bit about road mapping. Um, this is uh, the, actually, I think this is mostly what I just said. We're going to divide into groups. We're going to nominate a DRI. We're going to create collect action items and top takeaways. We're going to align on some of those audacious milestones that we want to work on through the rest of the year, and then we're going to have three minutes to report back on each one of these tracks. Um, and now over to Juan to tell us a little bit more about some of the tooling and why it exists. Uh, so uh, we have lots of different uh, teams, lots of different groups, lots of different approaches to road mapping and planning and so on. Uh, and one of the things that we've learned after you know, close to 10 years now of managing open source projects um, at scale with 
hundreds of teams and thousands of contributors, is that there's different levels to road mapping. So you can think of um, there needing to be different zoom levels to how you express the work that a project is doing or the work that a team is doing. And so just like you would have a very zoomed out view uh, of the world or you would have like a country view or a city view or a particular region, um, so you need uh, different zoom levels to roadmaps. So unfortunately, there is no, unlike uh, you know, Google Maps and other map tooling, um, tasks and tools around uh, tasks uh, don't follow a very nice um, zoomable structure. Uh, and so instead, uh, teams end up using very different types of planning tools for these different zoom levels. So um, you know, here I picked some examples from, uh, from the FEM team, which has, uh, in this case, three different zoom levels uh, of the roadmap. They have a, a super detailed engineering um, breakdown down to like estimations, down by like individual tasks and people and so on. Then they had kind of like a, a higher level plan with like a Gantt style chart, um, uh, combining this into kind of a week to month level view. And that was kind of what the team was primarily using internally. Like, so this is kind of the roadmap for um, you know, the, the, the team of teams that was the, the FEM team. And then uh, outside of that, the FEM team used a user facing roadmap to communicate its broader, larger scale milestones uh, to the rest of the world. And it's this Zoom three level roadmap that we're talking about when we talk we, when we try to create cross project and cross team uh, facing uh, roadmaps. This is kind of the the right granularity level to be able to communicate what you're doing on kind of a quarter to year time scale to enable other teams to understand what you're up to um, and be able to kind of uh, plan against your express roadmap um, to be able to uh, select what, which milestones to, to contribute to, which milestones to, um, to depend on, and so on. Uh, and just to kind of zoom a little bit into that level, um, this type of roadmap we found to be extremely successful in, in helping teams, uh, teams plan. And it's sort of this level of roadmap boils down to like a very, very simple structure where you want to just have a, a, a single linear representation of key milestones. You want it to map to the next, say, um, three months to a year and a half. Uh, if you sort of extend beyond that, it becomes uh, kind of too fuzzy and too intractable and so on. Um, this is kind of like the sweet spot of being able to uh, uh, interact with, with other stakeholders. Um, and you want the milestones to be few. So even here, this is kind of starting to stretch into too many milestones. Um, ideally, you want somewhere between three to six milestones, um, each of which um, should be kind of aptly named to be as expressible as you can. You ideally want a single uh, sentence that uh, many of the people surrounding that project could understand. Uh, this is not a roadmap for your team. Uh, with like inside jokes and inside references that make sense to your team. This is a, uh, a, a um, roadmap for the users and stakeholders of the project, so it should make sense to them. Um, so as an example, uh, milestone uh, one, introduction of non-programmable WASM-based FEM. That means a lot of things for the users of the FEM or the users of Filecoin. Um, milestone 2.1, ability to deploy EVM contracts to mainnet. Uh, that already in that single sentence expresses a lot about what you can expect once that milestone is completed. Um, then the description within that milestone um, says a lot more about uh, you know, the constraints and, and so on and kind of uh, expresses more about by the structure. And so this, this kind of roadmap with you know, three, to, three to six such milestones, um, a timeline of three months to um, you know, a year, year, a year and a half, um, is a really good sweet spot to be able to interact with a lot of uh, other users. And it, if you have that structure, it frees you from being able to use whatever tool you want to manage your own internal road mapping and internal planning um, while being able to kind of uh, work with others. So a tool that we developed uh, to help with this um, is Star Maps, um, where we uh, try to map onto this structure, um, and we leveraged uh, GitHub issues to then render these roadmaps and these dependencies um, in, a, in a detailed view. So you, um, there's a tool that, that will be um, uh, trying to use for those working groups that want to use it uh, to be able to describe these uh, roadmaps uh, in a way that uh, can show both like this kind of horizontal view or like the list view. Uh, but the point is like this tool lets you render both like the list view in the FEM style that I showed, like this kind of, uh, this kind of structure. And it also lets you compile a lot of other roadmaps into like a larger view so you can take these kind of whole cr cross project swath view into lots of activity going on. Uh, and it's all based on kind of uh, standard GitHub uh, dependency tracking and whatnot. Uh, cool.
All right, without further ado, we will begin our roadmap presentations, present backs from each of our tracks over the last three days of the IPFS thing 2023, starting with our opening keynotes, um, which I believe is gonna be presented by Steve. Let's go. Thank, thanks all, I know we had a captive audience for that one and I'm filling in here for Dietrich given he was doing many tracks. Um, so in terms of stuff we said at IPFS thing, uh, getting the HTTP routing v1 API, which was called reframe at one point into Kubo, that did happen. Uh, there was, uh, naming has been a theme over the last year. Um, a lot of that happened, but renaming the public IPFS DHT did not get done. That slipped a bit through the cracks. That top QR code is where we've had a discussion about it, and we'll push that over the line here in the next quarter, but if you want to follow along, hit that. Um, yeah, again, most of the things done, there's some content routing items uh, that I think we will need the content routing item track to speak to. And that last one, actually some of us didn't realize that a good formalization of the content routing problem had actually been written up by Juan a few months ago. So if you want to see that document, uh, uh, that's that second QR code. Um, but yeah, so that was our scoring from last time. Uh, in terms of some of the things that happened, right, we had some singing on stage. That was great to see. It felt like we were kind of mid-Cambrian as like the confetti is coming out of the pipe, but it's like it's not fully dispersed yet. But it was great to see that there actually are new implementations uh, showing up. Some of the things that we tried to get in place uh, back in Iceland are like actually occurring. Um, and that they are faster, better, and differentiated in different ways than Kubo. It felt like Kubo got defined and other people were uh, f filling in. Performance was a discussion, privacy was there, and it felt like there were undertones from things like Rhea driving things forward and yeah, this Boxo effort to extract functionality out of Kubo. And uh, yeah, the, the network rewards that we're seeing new, new projects and some new, new themes showing up. Uh, some of our learnings, like I said, we're actually doing this. There are new implementations showing up uh, and yeah, the, like that, that theory is starting to, to play out. We're seeing some of the value in the uh, renaming that had gone on. Like again, that Kubo was referred to a lot, but it was great to see it being referred to as Kubo, not as IPFS, so that again, it's creating more space. Um, the IPFS principles, uh, fantastic work that those exist, and I, but there was no discussion if there any disagreement on that yet. So that felt like a, uh, a win, but please, if you do disagree, bring it up. Um, and there was a lot of mention about things, people making things faster, um, but we gotta like start incorporating why was it faster and how do we, this, disseminate and pass that on. And it's wonderful that as a group, we kind of got twice as big in less than a year. So wonderful having you all here. In terms of some of the uh, actions, we, it would be great, you know, maybe it's with the organizers, if we can start off with a little bit more anchoring in terms of you know, where exactly are we going and how far are we from that finish line and where and where, who's, who's winning at it. Um, that was one thing called out. Uh, you know, obviously we're continuing to iterate on public, uh, sorry, retro uh, funding. And uh, yeah, so we wanna do a, sorry, um, impact evaluators and we wanna do a retro on that and explain for the community of how that's gone and get engagement. Uh, we will do the DHT rename. And uh, you know, there was a, uh, a push last time to get some alternative DHT work out there, but uh, so that didn't get done, but there's some promising things that Iro is pushing on, and even uh, Guy had been talking about how we can decompose the DHT and get more of a, a public uh, good out there that's decoupled from the current IPFS work. Um, so there's promising things, but that's not done, so that'll, cause those will get pushed forward by the content routing group. And on the implementer side, you know, we've got more implementations. We have this IPFS implementers bi-weekly sync. We need to get more people involved in that uh, and you know, sharing their progress and learnings, not on a once every six months basis, but a lot more frequently. So that's one of our actions we gotta push on. And that IPFS principles document that's out there that's good, it's a good start. We also let's start rolling in best practices. So that's, that's what we took away. Thanks. Hello everyone. Um, measuring IPFS track uh, and looking back at um, July 2022, we've got more or most of the things that we promised and put on, on our roadmap done. There are only two things left that were dropped for various reasons. We might be looking back into them, but um, they're not on our immediate priorities. So great work to everyone that contributed here. Um, learnings from the, uh, from the track. There is lots of interest in uh, measurement work and lots of people are asking for more numbers. So we should carry on with what we're doing. Um, video streaming plus IPFS are not in love right now, so we've seen that performance is not great, uh, and that's one of the items that we should carry on with and uh, dig a little bit deeper into that. Um, the IRO implementation is m very much measurement oriented, so they already have, although a new project, they already have uh, dashboards and ways that um, they measure performance, so this is great, well done, guys. 
Um, BitSwap is involved in content discovery in weird ways, which is not a new kind of learning. We knew that, but we now have a kind of conclusive statement uh, on it as well. Um, it has been impressive to see that IPFS kept working, uh, even when um, more than half of the network has been unresponsive, uh, which showcases how resilient it is in t uh, when, you know, in case of even an attack, that was not an attack, but, you know, uh, when things don't go as expected, so great stuff. Um, yeah, the Liberty P team has a new performance testing protocol, and they have committed to do more and more benchmarking, which is great. And we completed the largest measurement campaign in Libby2B's history, which has been the nut hole punching, uh, which was last December, as you remember. Uh, we collected more than six million hole punching um, results, and uh, which was great, uh, great results. Um, the success rate has been around 70%, a little bit lower than what we were expecting, so teams are looking into that. Uh, and there have been a number of important kind of uh, learnings in there, such as, you know, if a whole bunch attempt fails the first time, it's most likely going to fail any other time you attempt. So there is no need to wait and try again. Um, you just consider it done and, and get on. Uh, so this was uh, very helpful for the team. So from all the presentations that we've seen, um, kind of, uh, we get back to, you know, things might be working, but we should understand exactly how they work, and uh, that's only through doing measurements and looking into the details. So we should keep on doing that. Um, we have, we have our, maybe I should go here. So we have the Probe Lab team's roadmap on, on star maps, uh, which we put together at the beginning of the year, or maybe a little bit before that. And we're doing pretty well in terms of getting things done. Um, we've got three main um, uh, themes that require quite some work. One is the libp 2 privacy, which is going to be discussed in another track. We've got the um, um, measurement of the performance of Gossip Sub, in the, uh, especially in the Filecoin network, which is a big undertaking and an important thing to do. So that's what we're going to be focusing on in the coming quarters. And then we have uh, the CMI, the Continuous Measurement Infrastructure, where we're integrating all of the tooling that we're doing um, yeah, into one place, and we've been discussing with others that, um, with uh, Dave in particular, brought up that we should build APIs for others to contribute data into uh, into our infrastructure, which is important and great. So. Um, yeah, the, the 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 summary that I'm putting here, of course, is not um, repeating what the star map site says. But um, yeah, we we don't have Ian and Dennis here, so it, it's great to assign them tasks, and they're, we're going to, they're going to add more plots into the CMI, integrate all the measurement tools. We need to make that more visible through stats.ipfs.network. But for now, go to problab.io to get all the information you have. Um, yeah, and finally, a nice to have is to uh, to see to look in in detail into uh, video streaming of, over IPFS and see what's wrong there. Uh, yeah, that's it from me. Hey, everyone. Um, let's talk about data transfer. These were our milestones from last year. This was fascinating. This is the first time I'd ever read these milestones because I think I might have like gone home early uh, at the last year's uh, thing. Uh, so we uh, needed to. We said we would make a decision about an IPLI, uh, URI, IPLD URI spec. I think we made a spec. I don't know that we made a decision. I think our decision was we're not quite ready to do this right now. Um, by 2022, we were going to demo an adaptive transfer protocol. I guess this meant adapt, build some new production grade data transfer protocols. We definitely did that. There's been like a proliferation of awesome data transfer protocols in the past year, uh, in addition to the bit swaps and graph syncs. Um, so that's super awesome. Uh, there's been a ton of work that actually has gotten done. Um, we did, in fact, benchmark uh, and prototype uh, big block transfers. Uh, IRO is now shipping with this super well-developed uh, big block transfer protocol. We also did uh, prototype it within some of our more existing protocols. Um, uh, Dean did some specs on that. Um, one of the things we said we would do is have a serious conversation in 
Q2 of 2023 um, with folks about databases and IPLD. And I would like to announce that after much planning, we did that. We did it yesterday, or was it the day before? <laughs> when we had a track called IPLD databases in Q2 of 2023. Um, uh, we also said we were gonna make a test ground comparing at least three data transfer protocols. We actually did do that. Um, it is, um, it was something we built for the Move the Bytes work group, working group. We found out it wasn't actually that useful um, and was quite a lot to maintain. And now test ground is not something that we're heavily maintaining anyway. Uh, we kind of have to go back to the drawing board on how to truly build measurements that work across protocols. Um, we actually did a ton more this year on data transfer. This has been a huge year for data transfer. Um, we started last year, we like, the, the vibe was like, wow, we have like, not, we have BitSwap, it's not really quite working for us. Now the vibe is we have too much and we need to figure out how they're all gonna work together. Um, so anyway, uh, what did we do in the track yesterday? Well, first of all, we heard about two of the awesome new transfer protocols. Um, we heard about um, the BOW protocol that IRO is working on that has like super fast, um, large, uh, large block transfer and collection transfer um, within some narrow parameters. Uh, and then we have Carpool, uh, which is uh, this really awesome protocol for syncing data, um, which is slightly different than fetching. Um, we also, uh, Justin did this great talk comparing like all the options we have available for us at this point. Um, BitSwap, GrassSync, BOW, Carpool, and then just like fetching cars over HTTP. Um, we showcased that now that we have all these protocols, one of the biggest things is, is to have multi-protocol clients. Uh, and we looked at Lassie and Rapide, which are two of those. Um, we also talked about an effort that we actually did in, in the middle of the year to do an ongoing working group around this, the Move the Bytes working group. We learned so much through this group and there are some amazing videos on the internet, like multiple people have said, I learned so much just watching all the videos. But what we didn't do was accomplish the original goal, which was a complete bit swap replacement, which in retrospect might have been a little bit ambitious. Um, and one of the reasons that we all talked about uh, there, then this is sort of getting to what we're doing today, is that cross-organizational development is really hard. It's kind of an unsolved problem beyond data transfer, I think, in our ecosystem. Probably worth exploring. Um, and then finally, we explored some examples of how people are building on data transfer protocols. Um, some learnings, uh, bigger blocks, they're very important. They're useful. Maybe it's time to drop the block size limit entirely. Um, but in order to do that, you often have to adopt new protocols. Um, that add some complexity. Um, another conceptual thing that's come up a lot of times is that, is that fetching data is different than syncing data. Uh, by this, I mean fetching is like, I want to load a web page. I have none of the web page data. I want to hit this website and get it all sent to me, um, including all the images and or other assets. Sync is like, I have two different versions of, the, of, a, da of a set of data on two different machines, and I need them to match up. Um, and that actually is the two, that is a different operation that's quite important in many cases, and it's what Car Mirror is really well tailored to. Um, <clears throat> uh, another big learning, Lassie, I guess. It exists. <laughs> People, we talked about it a bunch. I don't know why <laughs> somebody said that, I'm not sure why. Um, uh, Use cases for data transfer are often defined by who is going to consume it. Uh, the best example is that like, if you're in a web browser, your data transfer options are super limited. And we need to start thinking about data transfer in terms of who we want to be able to use it. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why HTTP is increasingly something that we see as critical to the data transfer story. Um, Unifying IPFS and Filecoin, uh, which is something that we're, we've been starting to do a lot more with uh, Lassie and with work on the Filecoin side via Boost, is critical and because no one other than like maybe some like engineers probably only in protocol labs cares about these two networks as different entities. They just want to get their data, right? So that's super important. Um, Data transfer is a lot better uh, than it was a year ago. It is not solved. Uh, so this is an interesting thing. We had someone say, I think our learning was that data transfer is doing great now. And somebody else is like, uh, uh, I beg to differ. But that's different from last year where we were all just like, everything sucks. So um, that's a major, major plus. We've gotten to disagreement rather than agreement that it sucks. Um, 
So, yes, I know, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. There's a lot of text on here. Um, things that we need to do, we need to provide guidance on implementations. Uh, now that we have all these implementations, this isn't data transfer specific. We have all these implementations. We should really start providing guidance to people on which one to use when, because um, they actually have different use cases, and we should be clear on that. Um, I voluntold uh, myself and Justin to maybe take his table uh, that you had in that slide uh, about the different protocols and what they can do and just maybe, I would love to publish that somewhere because um, people are really curious about the different capabilities. Uh, project the increasing uh, success of the, like I think that we can count on PL Bedrock to talk to people about how retrievals actually are pretty awesome now, mostly, sometimes. Um, so we're gonna do that. Um, and uh, this is our milestones. I'm actually not gonna go through these because I don't think we fully have super agreement on it. Um, so I'm gonna go through the last two milestones. Um, but these, these ones that we have up here were, are definitely high value items, but I don't know that there was full agreement. Um, but I wanna talk about the two milestones that I would like to put out there, which is in Q2. I think we are all just gonna keep building our awesome things because they're getting better. They're not quite done. A lot of us has great stuff in progress and we're gonna keep doing that. And then what I will commit to is that in Q2, Q3 of 2023, I will start trying to figure out how to make a real cross-org roadmap for data transfer. So, yeah. All righty. So IPFS deployments and operators was not a track last summer. Uh, so we had no takeaways uh, and that make of that what you will. Um, so uh, we were also a half day track. So we were the afternoon on Saturday. Uh, so I probably don't need my full three minutes. So. We'll either catch up or you're welcome to future presenters. Um, I think, uh, so we, we talked a lot about, uh, so it ended up, and I didn't realize this until the day, uh, we ended up sort of extending the keynote sessions, right, where we introduced a lot of the new IPFS implementations. And one of the, like, the big things that I noticed from last year to this year, uh, right, so I go IPFS, renamed to Kubo, but now there is like, Kubo is not the only implementation. There are lots available. Uh, so we talked through some of those implementations, some of the use cases, right? So using IPFS to uh, distribute game assets was one of the, the talks that we had, uh, really interesting stuff. Um, we also uh, did a little bit of group therapy. We laughed, we cried. Uh, for those of us who uh, run IPFS in production, scaling issues, performance issues, uh, talking through a bunch of that. So some of the learnings, uh, yeah, so this kicked off in the keynotes, right? Kubo has sort of like shifted focus to be for self-hosting, um, which I think is awesome from the Kubo team, right? Like for one, just take a little load off uh, to stop trying to be all things to all people, uh, but also like putting that out there helps to create this space for all the other implementations. Uh, we had a talk from Peter about the release process being automated, which I think is such an awesome example for everybody else to follow, uh, much like IRO's like, measurements from the start. Uh, automation from the start is great. Uh, we did also have a talk uh, from IRO. Uh, it's really, really fast, but not really a drop-in replacement uh, for an IPFS node. Uh, so there's like some interesting things there, but not like we can't all jump and run IRO now. Uh, yet. Uh, Boxo, I think, was one of the most exciting things. Uh, it exists. Again, this is a, another like big transformation that I saw, saw from last summer uh, where we talked about like using IPFS as a library or lib IPFS, and now Boxo exists, and it's a thing that uh, other projects are starting to use. Uh, and then we had a talk from Guy uh, about how we can make the DHT potentially uh, more general purpose without completely uh, destroying performance. I think I got that right. Okay. Um, one of the big takeaways for operators is, okay, if Kubo is for self-hosting, what do we run, right? Like what, what do operators, what, what operators, what should operators be doing uh, with their IPFS infrastructure? Um, so the big sort of action items coming out of this are, uh, let's start collaborating. So Bunch of people in the room know because they attended. We ran for a few months an IPFS operators group where we sort of started to get together and talk about some of these things, right? Like what are best practices? What should we be doing? What are good configuration options? What's good uh, setup? How can we measure our own uh, infrastructure? Things like that. Um, so we have uh, basically like let's get that thing going again. Uh, 
running a working group is not a, uh, it's not nothing. It does take time and effort to, to keep moving. Uh, so thank you to Gus and Cameron for stepping up to, uh, to drive that forward. Uh, the other thing is starting to put together best practices, instructions in form of an operator's guide. Uh, also Gus, Gus uh, ended up a hero. Um, so we have uh, not dates on everything, um, but yeah, so like I said, sort of as soon as possible, reboot the IPFS operators group, start to share these things, uh, learnings, best practices, configuration options, all that kind of stuff. Um, another thing that came up is like a getting started guide. So if you are a new company or new to IPFS, uh, how do you run this thing effectively? Uh, it's real tough to figure that out. Uh, something came up as like, you need to talk to Boris. Uh, why Boris? I don't know. Um, so yeah, <laughs> operator's guide I mentioned. Uh, uh, mostly because Boris will connect you to the people that you actually need to talk to. Um, yeah, and so the last thing that it wasn't actually a session but came up in just our 15 minute thing, uh, the uh, IPIP 383 uh, that is being driven forward by the, the, the Bifrost gateway, uh, super important for operators, right? So if you have uh, SIDs that come across that are illegal content, et cetera, uh, how do we collaborate as a community uh, so that we're not all receiving DMCA takedown requests and stuff uh, over and over again? And that is that. Hey, so IPFS on the web. Um, uh, I wasn't here last year, so I'll try not to completely misrepresent the the, the progress we made in the intervening time. Uh, but basically, the the high level takeaway is that um, stuff like writing back um, in terms of specs and in terms of uh, gateway writable gateways is still not there. There's been a, some discussion, some progress, but nothing that has uh, landed. Um, things are somewhat uh, better in, in, in a, a number of aspects, like UCANs are a lot more uh, available, and uh, big happenings, uh, big things have been happening around web transport, um, better, much better connectivity. We saw, uh, we'll get to that on the next slide as well. This was a big theme that, that emerged. Um, and, and trustless gateways and gateways in general are much better. Um, we now have uh, more specs on gateway. In fact, the, the first specs to ship on the specs site were the gateway specs. So that was really great. Um, uh, what else? So yes, libp2p had uh, the, did the, the web transport um, uh, side of things. We did bring some connections between Capilun and the web people and, and more infrastructural stuff. Not better, but, but stuff happened. Um, we do have a minimum minimal um, IPFS spec, but it's probably too minimal, so we probably need to have a less minimal one on, uh, uh, on, on top of that. Um, uh, but yes, in general, there's been, there's been progress, but not everything has been done, so we're going to keep working at it. Um, the track recap is a little bit hard because it <laughs> It was, there was a lot going on. It was a very dense track uh, with a great variety of different topics. Um, turns out the web, the web is a pretty big place, and people are doing a lot of things with it. Um, but things that the thing, themes that emerge is that people like HTTP a lot, um, and uh, interfacing HTTP um, and, and IPFS and reusing it in, in different ways has uh, is something that that people are quite interested in. Um, things are getting faster. Um, service workers are proving to be an interesting way of implementing access to to, to IPFS. Um, one thing that 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 was um, that that came across um, multiple talks um, is that uh, IPFS is not just a way of getting content over to 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 HTTP, but also uh, properties of content addressability do help with other properties like security properties. Uh, and and there were there were several ideas about like how to build better web app models based on 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 that as a as a foundation. Um, things have been becoming easier uh, in terms of onboarding um, uh, devs. There's a jQueryification with new frameworks and new, new ways of, bringing, of onboarding people. Not perfect, but uh, improved. Um, uh, what else? Um, it's become easier to build your own uh, IPFS um, uh, server, which, uh, which is definitely helpful. Um, and in terms of learnings, as I was saying, the web is big, so there's a lot of stuff and lots of ways of connecting um, IPFS with it. 
the the landing of web transport has really changed things. It's it's made it possible to to ship things, to connect much better, uh, much faster, and so connectivity has has definitely improved. Specs help, um, but you know, in order for them to help, we need more specs. So uh, it's great that we have specs, but we need to spec more specs. Um, Mobile is still difficult uh, if you want to have uh, you know, co continuous connections. Um, it, it drains battery. It, 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 it causes, radio, causes radio problems. So this is still an unsolved problem that, that we need to get to. Um, and I was, as I was saying, yeah, the people are, are looking at IPFS not just as a way of, of moving bytes uh, to the browser, but uh, as, as bringing additional uh, benefits. Everyone mentioned user agency is great. People are focused on ethics. This is not the case in every community, and this is something that is, is really enjoyable uh, and pleasant here. Um, and uh, apart from that, people are fi still finding it somewhat difficult to, to run IPFS in production. That's it. Interplanetary databases. We have existed for one day as a group, so <laughs> much, much progress in that time. We had a number of talks where we learned that it turns out that there are applications that get a lot of value out of sticking a value into a database and getting a random number back, but some people would actually like databases that are not just key value stores where all the keys are random numbers. When we are trying to build applications out of databases, we need consistency because time is a thing and sometimes stuff needs to happen in total order. We learned that we need Merkle clocks because time is not a thing. In a distributed system, there's no such thing as things happening in a particular order. We talked about the ability to group transactions together, that often as people are doing database operations, you have lots of tiny blocks that are created, and it's really convenient to wrap all those things up into a car file and say, you're going down this list of car files that happened and either accept the whole thing or accept nothing because turns out transactions are important. People would like to have atomic changes to their data set. Shocking information. We talked about UCANs and permission. It's really nice if some people have the right to mutate your data and other people do not have the right to mutate your data. <laughs> Mostly we learned that there are real efficiency problems. As we are trying to build things like indexes so you can actually search data in less than linear time of all the data that is in Filecoin, you want to make sure that you can build things that are not just HAMPs, but real B trees, and that the poly tree work is important to that, and that if we do not standardize on some ways to do B trees and possibly LSM trees in the system inside IPLD, we are going to get B trees anyway. We're just going to get a dozen implementations that don't match. And most important learning, I think, was that there are a lot of people who are trying to actually build databases on top of IPFS. And now that we know each other exist, we should talk to each other and actually collaborate. So our final conclusions were really, we need to build databases on top of IPFS because applications want to have access to databases. Right now, when you look at an IPFS app, it feels like an IPFS app. That you don't ask someone, hey, what kind of app are you building? And they say, yeah, I'm, I'm building a SQLite app. Like, no, they're building an app that does what their app does, and SQLite is an implementation detail. We need to get to the point where IPFS and the IPFS databases are just sort of an implementation detail, and that that's not obvious from every line of code in the entire application, that there's a lot of cool new tools that people are using. We've got several implementations of Merkle clocks. Maybe it would be better to have one. We have several implementations of B-trees. Maybe it would be better to have one. Um, and that, doo -doo -doo. oh, uh, Quinn's talk where she talked about lots of ways in which there is fundamental chaos that must be embraced. And that we simply aren't going to live in a world where Jeff Bezos will give us the one true schema that all data must fit into. And we just need to accept the fact that some people will stick data into IPFS that does not match your schema. And your code needs to be able to deal with that without exploding. Because there are things where people have different goals than you. There are things where people will actively attack you. So our main conclusion was, 
if you have any interest in B trees and the internals of how all these databases work, go read the probably tree spec in the advanced data layouts of IPLD and make comments before we accept this as a spec instead of after, that we want to really be open and that we have new things, new kinds of databases that share facts and that it would be interesting to get lots of these different fact databases to actually compose with each other so that I can join my data against your data even if we are not running necessarily the exact same database. Thank you. All right, next up, content routing. Uh, so in the last uh, IPFS, uh, IPFS thing, there were two separate tracks uh, where there were prefixed content routing. One was content routing performance, and the other one was content routing privacy. And uh, this year, we just had one content routing track. So if you want to look back a little bit, um, the content routing privacy just explored how we can improve the performance of content routing uh, overall across multiple uh, components. Uh, uh, and content routing privacy covered a general overview of the challenges that exist in terms of making content routing more private, in general, introducing privacy in the, in the whole system. Uh, this year, we uh, combined those two. Um, uh, some of the milestones that you see listed here is already covered by uh, Steve earlier. Um, we now have uh, more than reframing Kubo. We have HTTP delegated routing, which is fantastic. Uh, we are not quite uh, there on the naming yet. Um, the I public IPFS DHT needs a name, as Steve pointed out. But uh, we have a uh, nicer structure in terms of uh, presenting network indexers. We now have a new IP acronym, which is called IPNI. Uh, there is um, specifications and so on, which I'll go on, uh, go on to a little bit uh, further later. Uh, we have big providers now uh, providing data into the uh, IPNI, which is fantastic to see. Uh, the rate of um, uh, SIT ingestion is growing very fast. Uh, we have uh, established a presence in IPNI for IPNI across the uh, counter routing landscape. Um, uh, there are survey uh, works that are still in the making. Uh, the counter routing uh, working group are working with the uh, probe lab to produce uh, more meaningful surveys, understand the characteristics of each of these components that exist in the counter routing ecosystem. Um, and uh, formalization still uh, needs work. I'll, I'll get into that in a, uh, in a, a bit um, uh, more. In terms of new DHTs, uh, sort of exist, uh, still working on it, but we, we, we definitely want uh, more DHT implementations, at least guidelines on how you would implement a DHT. Uh, new uh, content routing systems, because all you can see is just examples of things that could exist, not examples of things that should exist. Um, what a track we had. So uh, a lot of uh, interesting talks, um, great questions all around. Uh, we had a holistic view around uh, what content routing means in general. We had a, a walkthrough of the history and talked about how the content routing progressed over the years. Um, more than half of the progress that you see here happened in the last three years, so we highlighted what an active um, area it has been for improving uh, things, making things easier to find, as well as making things faster to find. Uh, we walked through how DHT is growing to support a huge scale um, of um, enable uh, DHT users to provide a huge amount of data very, very quickly. Uh, we talked about distinction, uh, we talked about what IPNI is because it has came up a number of times over the past few days uh, in terms of connection, uh, connecting systems and how it's been used to build other things on top of. Uh, we made distinctions about what is the difference between IPNI and, for example, sit.contact, what is missing, uh, the progress there. Uh, we talked about the cross-cutting concerns that are um, solutions for which are uh, bubbling up, which is fantastic to see that affect every uh, content routing system, and an example of that is uh, privacy. So we talked about what privacy means for existing components, such as DHT and IPNI, and uh, we uh, had an uh, example of an alternative uh, private data representation uh, from PeerGuards, which was great to see just to open up our horizons. And we finished the session by talking about um, what does scalability mean in terms of disseminating the ground truth of um, state as far as IPNI is concerned and how it can be used as a stepping stone or a platform uh, on top of which we're going to make a consistent decentralized uh, IPNI network. So the action items. So the action items that, uh, what do we need from, uh, from this world? So what we uh, need is 
uh, a name for DHT, uh, IPFS DHT, that would be fantastic. Uh, we need a clear DHT um, uh, specification. Uh, we need um, a DHT migration to really uh, happen and uh, provide us with reader privacy. Uh, we need better description of uh, how these content routing uh, interfaces work together because one of the things that came up actually was we're not really sure what content routing is. It's very uh, vague still, even though everybody takes it for granted, but it means different things to different people. Uh, so uh, lots of work to do there. Uh, content routing work group, how can we in include more people here so that we can uh, have a more representative examples of different systems for content routing? Uh, and uh, we talked about uh, um, needs for uh, POC implementations that make uh, c.contact not the only um, uh, IPNI endpoints that has significant data, but also we need more examples of it and figure out how these things are going to talk to each other. So we came up with three categories of working group. On the IPNI side, we want to formalize the ways by which the consistency across uh, indexer nodes is going to happen. That's not formalized yet. Um, all the hard stuff is assigned to people that were absent. Uh, so we had uh, Ivan working on rolling out uh, what reader <laughs> privacy means uh, for IPNI, and uh, Andrew, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, uh, to work on uh, formalizing this um, consistency across the indexers. We have working group on the DHT side to uh, guide and roll out what privacy uh, means for the DHT, and uh, there's, there should be cl uh, close collaboration between these two to make sure that they are uh, interoperating uh, once the uh, privacy exists. And uh, finally, a working group around um, engaging the community and providing better documentation in terms of uh, what content routing is, how you can create your own content routing, how is it going to fit in, and creating frameworks around that. In terms of uh, upcoming milestones, there are three that we are reasonably sure about, which is uh, rolling out reader privacy end-to-end, -end, both in terms of IPNI, i.e. switching all the lookup traffic to be uh, private, and then uh, rolling out the migration on the DHT so that we have these bo uh, both systems working beautifully together. Uh, we want to come up with shared um, uh, interfaces for content routing. There's a later meeting about this uh, in the coming days, so please come join us. And uh, we want to make it much, much easier for people to provide to IPNI directly, because um, we, we talked about use cases of IPNI that can fit. Uh, it's just making easier for IPFS nodes to provide to IPNI, as well as big, big providers that uh, it is enabling today. And uh, finally, for Q4, we're not quite sure yet, but we, we really want to formalize this uh, specification for decentralizing IP, IPNI and hopefully have an implementation of it. Thank you. This morning, we talked about HTTP gateways, also this afternoon, really up until just now. Uh, this was a new track, not really comparable to the things that we talked about last year, although there are some murmurings from previous goals that I handpicked here that indicated things that have evolved into the things that we talked about. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we talked about RIA, uh, and then some specific components of it, like Bifrost Gateway, Caboose, and Saturn. Um, we talked about how things like Web Transport and WebRTC can bypass the need for a direct HTTP gateway uh, and talk to more peers directly, and sort of that balance and how we do both. Um, we talked some about uh, our frameworks and tools for validating that a gateway is a gateway and what it's doing. Um, and then uh, we had a talk at the end on sort of how do all of the various incentives go together uh, to incentivize something like Saturn or a CDN uh, in a decentralized way. Learnings that came out of this. Uh, everything is a gateway was the first learning I was thrown. Um, gateways are important. You can run your own gateway. Uh, we seem to be getting lots of gateways. Uh, you can bring your own gateway with service workers and do your own validation. And so a lot of this was where does the validation happen? Um, and how do we incentivize more clients to verify uh, locally? How do we pull that verification towards the users? Um, to do's. There's a couple that we uh, sort of located with the existing decentralized gateway working group. Um, more external solicitation of feedback and more sort of external engagement uh, with the broad community. Um, and then also starting to look also at how large blocks should be supported within a gateway spec is something that that seems like an existing correct working group that should tackle that question. Uh, the Saturn uh, team uh, is considering productization of Caboose as a thicker client library and thinking about how do you, uh, what, what is the right logic that's reusable for, you've got a lot of gateways out there, you want your queries to go to the right one that's close to you, that seems fairly reusable. So we should think about that as a, as a component that gets built out. Uh, and then we also had 
this uh, to do that uh, there's a lot of people thinking about service workers and maybe that should come together in some sort of working group, like a service worker group. Um, yeah, or, 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 or a web worker group or, or some sort of group that works on services. Um, so, so, so something about that client side of interaction to, to IPFS seems like there, there's some knowledge sharing that we, we should be enabling a little bit more than we are. Uh, we wrote down a bunch of things that different people want to do. Uh, Q2, um, extensions of the current trustless gateway spec for what is actually being implemented, which includes things like SID slash path and, and some depths and some other sort of edges that aren't reflected in the spec yet. Uh, and also RIA should launch. Woohoo. Uh, Q3, um, Saturn hopefully has some productionization of this gateway client of Caboose. Um, and we would like to, by Q3, have uh, clearer error pages where when something doesn't load, it doesn't just time out, but instead it says, no one had this. Or maybe it says, someone had this, but I couldn't get it. Uh, but, but you start to get like some insight into what's happened and why you don't have the thing that you want. Um, and then by the end of the year, um, we'd really like to have a much clearer picture around service workers and sort of like these thicker clients We'd like that to be in use, that there's you know, regularly verification happening on these clients, and that we've got some resilience to any individual gateway going down, but that there, there is uh, some client-side work that has become a little bit more full flesh and not just experiments. Um, and then uh, also uh, specifications on writable gateways. So thinking about how do we actually uh, then store stuff through these bridges as well, uh, and, and how does that get discovered? So hello everyone. Uh, I was leading decentralized compute and AI track, and uh, since I wasn't here from the last year when there was uh, two tracks that were kind of similar uh, to decentralized compute, I'm skipping the uh, kind of skipping them. So the track recap: uh, we had a great uh, FAM demo by Matt Hamilton. He, the first time, uh, spinned up local Falcon network and executed it with a hard, uh, hard hat, everything done in 25 minutes. Then Wes Floyd uh, gave a demo on end-to-end on-chain FVM um, to off-chain compute, and then he got a result back, so it was a great demo as well. Then there was a fine-out computation with Aqua and Fluence and incre incremental reuse okay, orchestration of the day of, of it. Uh, then there was uh, privacy and security of on-chain data versus pu public open source solutions. So this is regarding to the talk that Portrait gave, um, how with one click using ChatGPT, uh, it scrapes Web3 data and creates quite impressive websites. And also we had a great panel uh, discussion uh, that raised a number of questions, potential uh, use cases, privacy and regulatory concerns related to uh, combining blockchain and AI. And uh, so this is our learnings. So we had a packed session today. And uh, so uh, learning started with, there are several approaches to compute and each appropriate for different use cases. Federated ML is, um, is at its beginnings, but it has quite a lot of potential, especially for decentralized uh, machine learning architectures. And there are like opportunities to attribute data to ML models via blockchain technology and IPFS. And uh, in lieu of verifiable compute reputation is the next best solution. And there was a great, um, a great talk on Autonomous, about, which is decentralized off-chain backends. So to do the action, uh, to do the action items for us, uh, so for the compute working group, um, create grid of describing use cases and solutions, um, create a landscape of decentralized compute solutions. So because there are quite a lot of different decentralized compute solutions, it was really hard to understand which has um, kind of you, uh, what's the kind of main high level differences between them, and. Um, also, uh, IPVM implementation in progress with MVP uh, that will be finished in Q3. 
Uh, there is a HOMSAR uh, and IPVM implementation focused on deterministic voice execution, and there is UCAN innovation spec. And for machine learning uh, working group, so we need overview of the variety of use cases for AA um, and ML. We also need to uh, create more awareness around um, uh, for Web2 builders around um, kind of what capabilities of decentralized compute and, uh, and AI can offer them. So uh, we need to also create a market for, for these builders and uh, bring, uh, show them the advantages of of this uh, new uh, architecture and solutions, and um, what we're also offering like, as a hardware. And for data privacy uh, working group, uh, solutions like uh, fully homomorphic encryption, zero knowledge, and encryption at rest. So, upcoming milestones. So, there was one missing here. Uh, so, we need encryption. It's okay. Thank you. So uh, the first and of, of most important is creating incentivized layer of for decentralized compute. Uh, then easy to use encryption to compute over encrypted data on AP in IPFS. Uh, crypto incentivized IPFS pinning uh, uh, protocol on FEVM and market overview of all the use cases and solutions projects providing compute solutions. That's it. All right, integrating IPFS. I'll try to make this real quick because I know this is the last one and everyone probably wants to get out of here. So what did we learn today in this very um, mixed track? So we learned that IPFS will probably go to space later this year and we learned about how that's going to happen. Um, we learned about Duren and the progress that's been made in invading the mobile space with IPFS. Um, we learned how to write code interacting with UCANs and how easy and sometimes confusing that is. Um, then we learned some about the IPVM and how that relates to UCAN. So actual learnings that we took away, UCAN is growing and growing and getting a lot of traction and that's super exciting. Um, BitSwap doesn't work in space, don't try it, probably not a good idea. Um, ACLs and CRDTs don't mix, sounds like a lot of people have tried that and it's not a good idea, so UCAN instead. Um, one thing that we did see is that as the track had a lot of different mixed talks, there was still a lot of interest across the different talks from different groups of people. So maybe at next year's thing or camp, we should think harder about how do we handle these talks that don't quite fit into the broad tracks, like what's a good way to, to put those in places that people actually know about them and can go find them. And then also Observable HQ is a really cool tool that Alan and Arakli used to host an interactive workshop with us. So action items, like what do we wanna take away from this? Um, from the UCAN folks, they would really like to see a UCAN2 implementation in Rust or Go. Um, they really wanna ship the invocation spec. Would love to see an interop test suite for UCANs. In general, please ship more production UCAN systems. Um, and they would love to see the IPVM built into Kubo. And then on the Duran mobile side, um, more docs and tutorials for forking the Duran app and what to do with that. And maybe David would love to see other people actually forking it and giving him feedback on how that process goes. And then potentially a mobile working group. So if you're building a mobile app that embeds IPFS, please go talk to David and maybe you guys can work something out where you share what you're learning with that. And then on the space side, Please, if you get a chance, clone the repo, test the code, perform a ruthless code review on it, um, give us some sort of feedback on that code, that would be excellent. And that's it. All right, thank you so much. I don't want to keep anyone from happy hour, so we'll, we'll leave it there. But there's a lot of things to go do, so um, make sure to continue following up with your track. Um, harness those action items. Make sure people who are not here are aware of all the things that we assigned them to go do to make things happen. Um, and let's get really excited about making sure we check in on some of these things over the next couple of quarters as well, so that we can make sure we make progress throughout the entire year. And really just thank you guys all for coming together, like getting this group to gather and share ideas, build momentum 
um, create these collaborations. That's how we actually get stuff to go happen. So thank you all for participating um, and really excited to see what you go make happen.